right. So, we have a sermon series. The longest sermon series in the history of Life Community Church. At least for the last 18 years that I've been here. This is going to be 13 weeks of sermons from the book of Ephesians. And uh, it's going to be preached by both Emmanuel and myself. There may be a couple of breaks in between. There's a couple of special sermons that will happen. Or, or maybe the Holy Spirit tells us, hey, the church is going through this situation. We need to have a special word for that uh, moment. And we'll just go ahead and just delay. And so it could be longer than 13 weeks long, but there's 13 sermons. Amen. 13 messages from the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is one of my favorite books. It is the only book of the Bible that I have memorized from front to back. Now, I've gotten older since I've memorized that, and I don't remember it all from heart, so I'll have to read it to you. But it is a, uh, when you memorize a whole book of the Bible, it is in your spirit. It is part of you. And it's always been, since I memorized that book, it's always been my ability to preach a sermon on just at the drop of the hat, if somebody was missing or somebody needed me to fill in, I could just walk up and preach sermons out of the book of Ephesians because it's a wonderful book. It's packed full of great information and is something that I've put into my soul. And I want to share that with you. I want to share with you 13 sermons from the book of Ephesians. This one is called Praise the Father. Of course, it's coming out of the first six verses of Ephesians. But I want to start off with just a little bit of an introduction of the book uh, so that as we go through this, we don't have to continue to remind you as we preach it. So Ephesus is one of the top five largest cities of its time in the Roman Empire. It is located between the eastern and the western parts of the, the empire. And so there's two main parts of the Roman Empire. There was different systems and different levels of of commerce and different commerce uh, that would be reached by each. There was also a little bit different politics because there were so many freedmen in the, in the uh, eastern side of the Roman Empire that uh, they had to go ahead and make certain allowances for the freedmen. And that were people who were Roman citizens that weren't born Roman citizens. And so they were eventually allowed to reach the status of citizen. And so these cities had a lot of their other types of uh, traditions and, and history. And then you had the, the uh, eastern side, which was more like your stereotypical movie about the Roman Empire. And it had that sort of, heavy, it, it was kind of a, a very rich, uh, but the, the, uh, for certain people, especially those who were not freed yet, who had not become citizens yet from these conquered nations, uh, it was a very heavy-handed area of the Roman Empire. But Ephes Ephesus sat right in between the two. And so it was kind of a bridge of the two types of societies. It boasted one of the seven wonders of the world at the time, and that was the Temple of Diana. Uh, you recall in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19, where Paul is being attacked by a large group of silver, silversmith, smiths who uh, create images of Diana and other types of idols. And uh, the, the success of Paul's preaching was so great in the city of Ephesus that it was hurting their business. So the silversmith, uh, they drummed up a whole bunch of uh, protesters, you know, kind of like a mob. They got on Twitter they told everybody that, hey, we're going to occupy Ephesus and we're going to get down in there and we're going to cause some trouble until they do something about this preacher called Paul. Uh, but also, something else that happened was that after a while, he, he survived that attack. And after a while, Ephesus, uh, after some of the teaching of some other uh, people that you'll find in the Bible, uh, by chapter 19, verse 19, it says that, that it was so successful that there was a mass Book burning. Now, normally book burning is a bad thing, all right? When I think of book burning, I think about the Nazis burning all the books and burning the Bibles and, and things like that. So book burning is not one of the things I suggest you take part in. It just isn't looked at very well. But this was a good, this was a good thing because the books of, of uh, magic and the books of, of incantations uh, 
were rampant throughout the society. They were a very superstitious city and uh, worshipped pagan gods. And so all of that information uh, in these books, the people of Ephesus came together and did a mass book burning because there were so many people that had been converted to Jesus Christ. Man, wouldn't it be great not to have a book burning, but to have such a great, uh, great awakening in our community that so many people got saved, that it became kind of a part of our society to put those things aside that are, that are not godly and to do it as a whole community. I believe it's possible. I believe the Holy Spirit and the Word of God still has power to save. Don't you? Amen. So besides Paul, the church of Ephesus also had other great teachers like Aquila uh, and Priscilla. And then we had Apollos. And then later on, even the Apostle John came and spent quite a bit of time in Ephesus and teaching them. They were so prepared by these teachers that Ephesus became one of the major places that the gospel was sent out from. It reached the world, the known world, because of what was done within Ephesus. So this is an incredible letter that we have here written to an incredible group of people. So Paul sent this letter to the Ephesians, but it wasn't just meant for them. They, they were given instructions to share. It was implied that they should share this with other cities and churches as well. And this is why there is no personal greeting within this letter. Many of Paul's writings have personal greetings at the beginning and then some toward the end say hello to so-and-so, send somebody to me uh, to assist me. There's no personal greetings because this was meant to be shared with many people and it's being shared with us today. It was meant to be shared with us today. So in previous letters, like in Colossians, uh, Paul focused on Christ, the head of the church. But in Ephesus, Paul emphasizes the body of Christ. If Jesus is the head, he's got to be the head of something. And Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, or the letter of Ephesians, it is focusing on that body. It's talking about us who follow Jesus Christ. It is filled with praises and, uh, and the wonder that Paul felt about God and what he was doing through Christ in the church. So it's a beautiful book. In fact, some have called this letter to the Ephesians the divinest composition of man. Of course, we know the Holy Spirit inspired this, didn't, don't we? but is the divinest composition of man. So let's begin our 13 weeks together. Amen? So let's read. I'm going to be reading to you the entire segment today. It's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 6. And then I'm going to go back and we're going to break down each verse. So Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us, for, for adoption to himself as sons through J Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved, capital B, meaning Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this message today, but also this entire series. I pray that the life-changing, world-changing message of this book would go out within us and not return void, but then become part of us so that we might be able to share this with those who are not with us today. And we pray that we become a part of us so that we can be transformed just a little bit more into the image of Jesus Christ himself. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. 
So this is Paul talking about his authority to write this letter. Now, he already has some authority with him because he was there. He had talked to them. He had shared the gospel. It was, it was part of his success story that he had been there and converted so many. He stood up against uh, those forces that would squash the church and was successful in spite of it. So he had earned himself some street cred within Ephesus. But, oh, stop smiling at me. Yes, I'm almost 60, but I can say street cred. I used to have some, but no. So anyway, Paul is also talking about the authority that came from God, not just from his own actions, not just from what he did, but from the calling that God had placed on his life. And so in 1 Corinthians, we, we look at a bit of what's going on within this calling. Why does he have authority to send this letter to the church? Why is there such authority in this letter that is allowed to be part of the Canaan, the, the, to be a part of the scriptures that have been passed down to the last two millennia? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 8 through 10, Last of all, as to one untimely born, that's speaking of himself, Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by grace, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is within me. See, he was not part of the group of apostles that walked with Jesus as he began his ministry and he was calling people like John and James to leave their nets and to become fishers of men. He, didn't, he wasn't one of, a part of the apostles that were like Matthew who were collecting taxes and, and uh, he walked up and said, hey, would you like to follow me? And he dropped his business, which was so treacherous and so treasonous, and became a follower of Christ. He wasn't part of that group that saw Jesus Christ uh, feed the 5,000. He wasn't part of that group who saw Jesus Christ in such an intimate way. But he was somebody who saw Jesus Christ arrested. He was somebody who saw Jesus Christ tried. He saw Jesus Christ tortured, probably, and he saw him die. He was one who began to hear about the reports of Jesus Christ being resurrected. The one thing, though, about Paul was his name was Saul at the time. And Saul thought that Jesus Christ was somebody who was a false prophet and leading a cult. And so he did everything he could to squash what this leader had done. He had become a martyr, and the people were claiming he was alive again, and this was starting to pick up momentum, and Paul was zealous, or Saul was zealous, to destroy this new way. It wasn't called a Christian church yet. It was called the way, the way of Jesus Christ. And he was going to destroy that way. And he said, I am the least. I am unworthy because I persecuted the church. And he was, just like all of us would be unworthy to write such a letter, except for the grace of Jesus Christ. And we can work hard and, and put all of our time in. Uh, some of you sometimes, you, you think that I'm working too hard. Some people think I'm not working hard enough. But for you blessed people think I work too hard. You know, it's not me. It's Christ that works in me. I cannot build a church. I cannot even teach you. I can't lead you if it was not for the resurrected Jesus Christ. In fact, if he was not resurrected and part of my life, then you would be a bunch of fools to be listening to me today. So then we also find in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born. So God has a foreknowledge, and God knew that he was going to appoint somebody for a very special purpose within the apostles, this group. Now, I believe that the ministry of apostleship is still in the church today. I believe it's part of the five-fold ministry. But it's not the same as this group. This particular group of, of apostles were people that were going to inaugurate the church. And they had some very special uh, purposes. But all of us can be part of the apostolic ministry of our church. 
To be an apostle means that you're a sent one, that you're somebody sent to establish or reestablish the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. And surely these men did that, didn't they? And these women. Um, and so we, uh, we see that he was uh, called, that he had somebody that was set apart. That's, that's the root of the word sanctified. He was set apart for a special purpose before he was even born. And who called me by his grace. So at a time when he was needed, a call was given. And it wasn't because Paul had earned it. He was actually... Leading, his efforts were leading to the death and imprisonment of people who were the children of God through Jesus Christ. And so he didn't earn this, but it was by grace, unmerited favor. And not, you know, grace is more than unmerited favor. Grace is sometimes an unmerited ability to have the grace. Like I've said many times jokingly, well, almost jokingly, I could never be a children's church leader. I love kids, and you know, but I also say all things in moderation. You know, I couldn't do it like they do it. it. It would drive me crazy because I have not been given the grace that accompanies the calling to do that. Those who are working with the kids, you know, they may joke around a little bit, but they love it. They love working with them, and uh, and I love working doing what I'm doing because God gave me the grace for my calling, and the same is true for you. So. It's by, he was called by grace it, it, and was pleased to reveal, to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him, and here's a special purpose, among the Gentiles. So he was revealed to him. We all know the Damascus Road event, you know, that old phrase that some people might still use today, you know, he was, that, uh, yeah, that guy is going to be knocked off his high horse one day. Well, that goes back to the story of Paul. That Saul was riding to arrest some Christians, and he was knocked off his high horse, his, his zeal and his pride, and knocked down to the ground and blinded by Jesus Christ, and he heard the voice of Christ calling him. He was knocked off his high horse. And that was that time that Jesus began to reveal himself to Paul. But not just in that time. He also spent some time three years with some other uh, disciples of Christ, not the apostles, but disciples of Christ, and then eventually spent time with the apostles. And so this was all being revealed to him so that he might be able to preach to the Gentiles. By the way, if you're not a Jewish person today by birth, uh, you are a Gentile. All right, go Gentile. No, but you know, in Jesus Christ, which means to be part of his body, there is no more Jew, there is no more Greek or Gentile, there is no more master and slave, and there is no more male and female in the body of Christ. And we are all equal. And so it goes on that I did not immediately consult with others, and I explained to you the process that he went through. So if you think you are beyond believing in Jesus Christ today, that following Christ is weak-minded. If you're here today and you think that you are too bad for Jesus to save, you are exactly the person that Jesus called Paul to preach to. The whole purpose was Paul of Paul was for you. Because he was that person that was beyond reaching, beyond believing, beyond any of this message that was being preached, that Jesus decided to call him, and Jesus Christ made a way for him and gave him the grace that was required to be a believer and follower of Christ. So if you're here today, and you think you're beyond believing, following, and, uh, and being saved, listen, Paul would beg to differ because his testimony says that he is he is an example for you. So, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, it says also in the second part, it says, uh, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So, saints, the word saint or saints in the Bible, it means that you are set apart to serve God. And you, it's another way of saying it is that you're a friend of God. You know, so if you're my friend, you do this. If you're my child, you do this. So 
you are set apart, just like Paul, to, do, to serve God. And so all of the Christians who follow Christ, all, all the people who follow Christ are called saints in the New Testament. Therefore, you are all called to serve Jesus Christ in whatever capacity he has called you. Because not all of us are the ear, not all of us are the nose or the eye or the foot, not all of us are the hand. We all have particular gifts and callings from God so that the whole body can be complete and accomplish the mission of the body of Christ. So therefore, your calling isn't the same as mine, and my calling isn't better than yours. You know, one person in the church that may do one particular job can't look at another one and say, hey, they need to get busy. No, they're busy doing what God's called them to do, hopefully. <laughs> That's the purpose of being a follower of Christ. So it's not about your current behavior. It's all about your future service to Christ. So saints are the faithful in Christ. And Paul will use this phrase 10 times in the very first 14 verses of Ephesians, that the saints are the faithful in Christ. So let's go to verse 2. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a combination of both Greek or Gentile uh, and Hebrew blessings put together. And it has a very, very deep meaning in light of the ministry of Jesus Christ. When you say this, if you would have said this before Christ as to the Greeks or to the Hebrews, it would be something like, uh, God bless you when somebody sneezes. It was a greeting. It was a blessing. It was a greeting. But it, it significant was, significance was kind of lost. But when this was... When you take this in light of Jesus Christ, it means much, much more, this blessing. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because now you've been given away. So it was the grace of God that brought them to Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, they now have a right relationship with the Father in heaven. That's why this blessing means so much. It was by grace through Jesus Christ that they could now have a right relationship with the Father. Especially in, in Ephesus, this means a lot. Because in Ephesus, many of the believers were former slaves or people that were just about to be free. They were sometimes moved from the city of Rome because the number of slaves in Rome would grow so big that the citizens of Rome would become worried that that would become a mob and take over. So they would thin the crowd of slaves within Rome by sending them out as kind of a halfway freed slave and send them out to all the different provinces like Corinth and Ephesus and others. And then they would eventually become freedmen in those areas if they behaved themselves. And so these people who are hearing this in Ephesus are former slaves, many of them, most of them former slaves, so you can imagine the joy that they felt as the words of Paul elevated them. Elevated them to a new status. Now, it didn't, they, they weren't elevated in a new status within Ephesus or Rome. They were elevated to a new status within the body of Christ, the church. See, when you come to the church, it doesn't matter if you were a slave or not. When you come to the church, it doesn't matter if you were a drunk or not. When you come into the church, it doesn't matter if you're a drug addict or even a murderer. When you come to Jesus Christ and repent and, and he fills you with his Holy Spirit, you begin to walk in obedience with him, then you are elevated in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And some of you needed that, didn't you? You needed to be elevated. And you, I hope that the first church you walked into did that. But unfortunately, even we're an imperfect church filled with imperfect people. So why should we think that other churches aren't as well? We're people. And there's people in this church here that you will never see them sin. I'm not saying they're not sinners still. They fall short of the glory of God. They're not like Jesus yet. And sin in the broad sense is that, not being like him. But there are people in this church, you may never see them sin. They've been walking with Christ a long time. They've been submitting to the transformation of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. And, and 
man, you just look at them and just say, thank God for this testimony that, trans- that Jesus transforms people because I need transforming. And so I want you to look at those people and not be jealous or, or not think that they're looking down their nose at you, but in a church like this, you've been elevated to be somebody who should hope that you are like them and will be like them. By the way, when you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ by his grace, when the Father looks at you, you're all the same, sin-free. You're just like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 is an example of the Jewish blessing. And it's, it is a declaration of praise that we uh, find in almost every Jewish prayer. So here's the blessing in Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Of course, they're not saying Christ, but they're saying God, the Father. Or not the Father even yet, but they're saying God. That God bless you. God bless you in this way. And so this is an example of the same type of blessing that would be in every Jewish prayer. But Paul tells us uh, that, that this blessing now is possible because of Jesus Christ. The insertion of Jesus Christ in there is something that's not just possible, but it's been proved. There are many who are like written letters, written epistles, who people can read and see that this is true, that God blesses his children in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us that we are blessed in Christ in every spiritual blessing. In, in other words, we... In other words, there is no real spiritual blessing outside of Christ. That's what he's saying. When he says you're blessed in Christ in this way, he's saying there's no real spiritual blessing outside of Christ. So do you have a desire for real love? It's found in Jesus Christ. Do you desire to live in real peace in your heart and mind? It is found in Christ Jesus. Would you like to experience the great joy and the depths of your soul that so many in Christ experience? Well, it can be found in Jesus Christ. So how about patience and kindness, goodness and, goodness and every good uh, or godly virtue? It's found in Jesus Christ. That is our blessing. Ephesians 1.4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It goes on to say in love, but that should be in the next verse. So even, even as he has, uh, he's blessing us, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. He initiated his self-revelation to his creation. His creation could not perceive him after the fall in the garden. But God wanted them to perceive him. And so he revealed himself throughout the the Old Testament and then now in Jesus Christ perfectly. He chose us. From the foundations of the world, God created a way for us to be holy and blameless before him. That's what that means, that we were chosen before the... He made a way. We were chosen before to have a way. He didn't choose us and suspend our free will. We have free will. In fact, you can't love without free will. Love has to be chosen. And to make a choice, you must have free will. God did not strip you of your free will and make you love him or make you hate him. But God made a way from the foundation of the world for you to know him, to come to him, He chose his creation. Everyone was chosen, but not everybody answered. And so we were chosen to be a particular group, to be holy and blameless. We begin our journey with Jesus Christ as being holy and blameless because of our legal status. We are covered with the blood of Jesus. So his righteousness has been applied to us. But then he just doesn't want us to stay that way, to be a bunch of heathens running around doing evil things, but we have the blood of Jesus on it. Uh, that, would be, uh, that would be kind of uh, 
I don't want to use the word stupid. <laughs> and God's not stupid. God's not a chump. God's not going to get walked on that way. So once he makes it, once we have, have admitted to ourselves and have sorrow over our sinfulness, and we repent from that, we turn away and we start to turn toward his way, and we receive him as the Lord of our life, Therefore, the Holy Spirit comes into us, seals our salvation, and the blood of Jesus covers us. And therefore, legally, in the eyes of God, we are holy and we are blameless. We can stand before him in the judgment and have nothing brought against us. He promised to not remember our sins against us, and he never will. So, then we begin our walk with him. And we are transformed over time to be like him. So we are becoming, in reality, what he made us legally. And so, thank God. I, I love uh, the scripture. I don't remember the reference. I didn't have it in my sermon. But it says that God accounts to a man. If a man purposes to do something in his heart, God accounts it to him. So it was, at the very beginning, he shows the grace. You haven't shown me yet. But you said in your heart you want to. And therefore, he counts it to you. And that's kind of like coming to Christ. You would receive him as Lord, but he's not quite, you're not quite walking as a perfect uh, copy of Jesus Christ, are you? And that's why the grace of God is so important. So how does he do this? He covers us with the blood of Jesus. So let's go to Ephesians chapter five or chapter 1, verse 5. It says, In love... He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons or children through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now this scripture here gets all twisted around and then it leads to a lot of twisting of other scriptures. Listen, predestination doesn't mean that God predestined you to be saved and he predestined these people on this side to be lost. That's not, I mean, is that really consistent with what God says he is? what the Word of God says He is, that He is just, there's no shadow of turning, that He is not someone who would be so arbitrary to create something to punish. God never created anything to punish it. He didn't create the demons. The demons were angels. And the angels chose because they have free will. And a third of them fell. He didn't create us to be punished. He created us to walk with Him in the cool of the day in the garden the Garden of Eden. But it was us who chose to fall. And in our lives, even though you know, there's this, this uh, sin that is in us because of Adam and Eve, that sin that is in us is not uh, causing us to be guilt-free. It's their fault. But because they did that, we also are people who make similar decisions. We start off as sinners, and then we can make a decision to love God and be saved. And so that's what that original sin does to our lives. We start off, we start off needing grace. And so John wrote in John 3:16 that God so loved the world, not just Christians, not just Jews. He loved the whole world. Every person in it, God so loved the world. And of course, he sent his son. But in John also writes in chapter 1 verses 12 and 13, if you'll put that up there for me, he wrote but to all who did receive him. So he loves the whole world, but there's something now for those who did receive him. So he loved the world and sent his son to the whole world. He sent the opportunity to the whole world to be saved from their sins. But now there's a distinction between those who did not receive him and those that did. So he says, but to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we are predestined for something called adoption. I don't know if you're an orphan today, but if you were adopted by a loving family, I think you could teach us today about what it felt like if you were adopted as an older child. And there may have been days where people were coming to adopt children, but you were not picked. 
And then suddenly, one day, a family came in, and they wanted to talk to you. And then later, you were informed that after they talked to you, they wanted to come back and adopt you to be part of their family. What a day. What a day. But see, we were people who had no real family. We were people that were disconnected from our Father in heaven. We didn't have a Father before, but He became our Father because of Jesus Christ. And when we received Him, we are then adopted into the family. That is good news. That is a blessing. That is something that's praiseworthy, isn't it? That's why this first six verses is called the praise of the Father, because the Father walked into your life. He walked into your orphanage, and He chose you, and He gave you opportunity. And if you would only say, yes, I will go home with you, then He took you home with Him that day. And let me tell you, you weren't adopted by a homeless man. You weren't adopted by a poor man. You weren't adopted by a powerless man. But you were adopted by the Lord of lords and the kings of kings who is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. You were adopted by the best father that could ever walk into your life. So when we sing songs of praise and worship, we party. Because we're adopted. We're adopted. In Ephesians, the last scripture, so if the praise and worship team would like to come, I'll only preach for another 20 minutes. (laughs) They love it when I call them up and then I kind of get inspired. But by grace, they're still with me. Now listen to this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of His grace, glorious grace, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. The fact that you and I are children of God, adopted children of God, is an incredible demonstration of grace. For more of some of us here, it's a super-duper incredible demonstration of grace. And God doesn't just demonstrate His grace once. But He demonstrates His grace over and over again in our lives, doesn't He? When we fail, when we sin, when we come to Him and we confess to Him, not some other man in between us and God, but to Him, it says that He is faithful. He's got fidelity. He's like a faithful husband, a faithful wife that doesn't cheat or lie or have secrets against you. He is a father who is a faithful father. It says that when you confess your sins that he is faithful. And not only this, he's not a chump, but he is just. He's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. So his grace is extended to you over and over and over again in your life. There's the grace of your calling, the ability to actually succeed in what God wants you to do for him, and the grace to actually enjoy it, even though it may be difficult. That is the reason we should be praising God. The source of all our praise. Yes, he blesses us, and we praise God for maybe good jobs, and we praise God for good finances, or we praise God for uh, good health or, or healing, or we, we praise God for many, many things. But the reason why we should praise God even when we don't feel like praising Him is because He showed the grace to adopt us and make us His children and make us joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ. God forgave us, and made us members of his family. I believe God chose us all because he loves us all. I believe he has spoken to the heart of every single created person, every single person who ever walked this earth, felt the presence of God and the, the urging 
of the Holy Spirit to be righteous, to be right with God. But not everybody says yes. But everybody's been given the grace to say yes. By grace, God has given you the ability to say yes, but he has also, by grace, given you the gift of volition, the gift of free will. So God's not going to force you. He's not going to force you to be his child, to be adopted, to follow him, to be blessed by him. He's not going to force you to choose that. Instead, by grace, he allows us to to choose to say yes. And so today I ask, would you say yes? And if you have in the past, would you say yes again?